This is Melissa Harrison here, Managing Director of the Media Project, and this is our first Media Project podcast here on September 11th, and we are joined by Clemente Lisi, who is a professor of journalism here at the King's College and a friend of the Media Project. You've probably seen Clemente's pieces on our website. He's reported on a number of different topics for us, and so thank you for joining us, Clemente. Thanks for having me. So we're talking about 9-11, and you know, for Americans all over the country, there are memories. People can remember specifically where they were at that moment that the first plane hit that first tower. But especially from a perspective as a journalist, you've written a piece for our website today about your reflections on 9-11 and where you were that day and what you remember as a journalist. And first, I thought it was really interesting in the beginning of your piece, you talk about the fact that It's so important that we remember and that we we share these memories because there are people now that you're teaching who were born the year of 2001, some of them maybe not even born by September 11th. Yeah, that's correct. Um, They're freshmen entering college now who were born in 2001. So they were either born that year or after the event. So they have no recollection. Up until very recently, if you speak to college students, you'll hear that they were two, three, four, five years old and have some vague memories of, of... parents watching TV or being sheltered from the news, but this generation has no recollection. They were either too young or not born yet. So it's very important to talk about it to inform future generations about it. Yeah. And in your piece, you take us through that day for you. So take us through it now. What what was the morning of September 11th like for you as a reporter? Where were you working and how was your day beginning? Right. So September 11th, the, the awful part of it, not just the outcome, but it started off as a really beautiful day. Um, summer-like day, and it was primary day in New York, which meant people were voting, and that was sort of the big news uh, at the time Michael Bloomberg was running for mayor of New York. Uh, The mayor was Rudy Giuliani at the time, and so that was the big story, who's going to replace Rudy, and primaries on both sides, so it was going to be a very political day, and very, with politics, the outcomes are determined in the evening, so the the, the day is kind of slow, and then you kind of lead up to the evening where you get poll results, and, and final results from the polling places. So I called my editor. I said, you know, anything going on? They said, no, come on in and we'll find an assignment. And I, I, I point out in the piece that being a reporter with no assignment is kind of the worst thing because you're kind of in limbo for a few hours. And yeah. as a reporter, you want to go out and tell stories. But you know that most of the news that will be happen that evening, that's sort of news you can prepare for. But it was on my way into work where the first plane hit. And, and you know, it was only 17 years ago, but technology has changed so much now that at the time there were no smartphones, there were flip phones, texting was very rudimentary, people didn't have internet on their phones, there were no tablets, no Twitter, no Facebook, uh, as we know it today. So you still could be somewhere and not know what was happening. So really the only people that knew what was going on, at least were getting inkling of what was happening, was if you were home watching on television. Mm -hmm. Perhaps two minutes ago, look at that. A jet plane, clearly a jet plane, a good-sized airplane, slamming into the second tower. So when I got to the newsroom, editors were standing around watching TV, and we've all seen that image of the World Trade Center with smoke billowing out of the side. And and everyone thought, oh, well, it must have been a small airplane. An accident. An accident. It was a clear day. It couldn't have been anything more than like a a four-seater plane kind of thing is small prop planes that fly around New York, the New York area, and it was a mistake and, you know, minimal damage. But, you know, still they told me, run downtown, you know, and uh, let's report this story out. And it's okay. So I, I got back on the subway thinking that's the fastest way to get around, and it is, especially during rush hour. And, you know, you start realizing that maybe something is happening. It's just sort of a feeling I had, but still no idea that it was going to be what it was. I think no one could imagine that. And there were, when you were underground, there were train delays as that was... That right, there were the train delays time. as we're heading downtown because now trains are being backed up because trains that were going to the World Trade Center, because people who live in New York remember that there was a subway stop inside the lobby below the World Trade Center. So And trains that led downtown, a lot of people worked there. They were getting backed up, and so there were problems. So I got out around Washington Square Park, which is still a good mile and a half away, but it, it was a surreal experience getting out of getting from above ground and seeing all the smoke... And realizing that people were sort of trying to figure out what was happening. And, you know, I was walking by cars and vans that had the radio up loud. And, and now, and it's been over, I'm in the Carroll Gardens section of Brooklyn, 
and it's been like snow over here. In that way, it might as well have been 19... 19- 41. You know? I know. When you wrote about that, that really stood out to me because you could just visualize people near a car trying to listen, hear Correct. what they're saying on the radio because, like you're saying, there's not the, we don't have the mobile access right. at that time Correct. to yeah. news. Correct. So there wasn't this individual ability to gain news. So you had to be in front of a TV, and most people didn't have televisions unless they were, had them at home or in their offices. And then the radio, and we still were not sure what was happening. And I always tell people, as I'm heading downtown, afterwards I told people, People who were at home around the world knew what was happening more than I did. And I didn't, you were right there. And I was right there or I was a mile away, so I can see what was happening. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize another plane had hit uh, the second building because I was underground. I decided to take my notebook out, start talking to people, and you know, get the usual reaction quotes. They were scared. They didn't know what was going on. Um, but still no inkling this could be terrorism. And so I got really, really close at that point, just a few blocks away. Um, and people were just standing around. And then... But one of the towers collapsed, mm. and it was this loud, crackling sound that is a sound I'll never forget. <laughs> that sound of that building collapsing was playing itself out at the same time as people were shouting and screaming mm. in agony. Because you realize people that were either in the building or near it were going to die, so... And for a reporter in New York, you know, I've covered my share of crime and awful things, but this was something that, unless you were a war correspondent, this is something that is off the charts if you're covering local news in any city in America, right? This is beyond that. Right. And you talk about you bought a cell phone the day before, literally, right. for $200. <laughs> yes. September 10th, 2001, I decided, finally, let me get a cell phone because every time I had to call my office, I had to use this 800 number they had given me from a pay phone. And in some places in New York, pay phones either don't work or they weren't around. Or if I was in the suburbs, there weren't pay phones. I said, let me finally get a, f- a phone. It was a flip phone. And of course, it didn't work that morning. All the signals were jammed. Yeah, you couldn't get through. But you finally did get through. Finally got through to my office, mm-hmm. and the reaction by the person on the other end was like, oh, thank thank God you're alive. And I was a little bit sort of taken aback by that because at that point I had sort of, I you know, to backtrack a little bit, I had I had to outrun the smoke, the mm-hmm. fumes, the, the dust, because I, my training had always been that it wasn't a fire that can kill you, but it was the, the, the smoke right. from it that fills your lungs. So when you see police officers, big burly guys running, you know, away from that, yeah. you, you figured, let me run in that direction with them. Yeah. They know what they're doing. So, you know, so my fear was to get away from this smoke. And you see pictures of reporters and photographers who are covered in soot. I was luckily not, I didn't get any on me. But afterwards, I was walking around lower Manhattan, Stock Exchange, Wall Street, and it looked like nuclear winter. Like it looked like it had wow. snowed a few inches and it was just this gray ash. And of course, I have no photos of it. We've all seen photos, but I took no photos because I didn't have a camera. You know, nowadays it would be that image would be on Twitter instantaneously. Mm-hmm. Back then, reporters still had to do their job and filter out this stuff. And, and you know, a lot of brave people were there doing that work. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so, yeah, so that then, you know, people didn't get those images until much later on TV. The thing is, people were watching this live on television. Right. So that was happening to a whole country, a whole world was watching this in real time, which also makes it unique. And when you write about this, I... I was really taken by how you said you, you're viewing this. Okay, first, you're, you're a reporter doing your job. So right. you keep that distance. I'm Correct. more trained. Report, get the facts. Don't don't let the emotion get in the way. Yet at the same time, you're a, a New Yorker watching your city and right. the history of your city right. before your eyes unfolding in this way that you could have never imagined. Right. Yeah. The World Trade Center was always a very... Um for a New Yorker, that was always a place, no matter where you were, in Manhattan especially, if you looked at, towards the World Trade Center, you knew what direction you were going in. So it was kind of like a compass. So to see that building come down was just shocking and then part of our skyline and part of our landscape and part of our identity. The the FDNY, the Fire Department in New York, their patch has the World Trade Center on it. It still mm-hmm, does. Mm-hmm. It was part of the silhouette of the skyline. So to, to for that to disappear, to physically disappear, was something that was was shocking and then that's where i went from being reporter to just for a second being just a regular citizen and and feeling like i had been personally hurt by this yeah just heartbroken right correct right and then so as a reporter you continue doing your work you call in there 
Yeah. Like, great. Glad to hear. Relieved to hear that you're alive. Right. But now you, you're like, okay, of course I'm alive. Yeah, that was your of course response. I'm al- of course yeah, I'm that, alive. Yeah, I'm was, where do I go? Yeah, that was our response. Do do? Like, where do I go? And then I knew there was a hospital not far from here, NYU Downtown Hospital, which is near the Brooklyn Bridge, which is, you know, for people looking at a map, it's it's going east. So it's a good distance away, but it would be the place where people would go if they were injured. So I get there and great, all the doctors are waiting outside, there's this mobilization happening at the hospital, you know, waiting for people to come. And so I'm like, okay, this is a good place to be because if anyone's going to come here, I'll talk to them. Right? And we waited and waited and waited and nobody showed up. Just regular people going to the hospital, a woman was going to labor, went to the hospital, but nothing happened. Nobody came. And then by three o'clock, we realized, you know, everyone, everyone who was in that building is probably dead. Wow. And so that was something that was shocking because I really, it, it goes to show you how the magnitude of the event was still hard to process because mm-hmm. we were still operating as if this had been, okay, fine, the building collapsed or, or both of them collapsed. Maybe they partially collapsed. I mean, at that point, you couldn't see anything. Right. You know, you couldn't, the sky was darkened. You really couldn't, by being there at the epicenter, you really couldn't figure out what was happening. Right. So that was that was almost a tricky part. It may be the only time ever, I think, in journalism where being near something actually hindered you from knowing more about it. Right. For, for broader context. So you waited there, no one came through. I mean, just right. reading that for me too right. was just like... Yeah, it was... that, that encapsulates the fact that, that nearly 2,000 people died that day and, and a lot of them were... First responders, police officers, fire, firefighters who were responding, but then a lot of people who worked in those buildings who were just trying to make a living um, passed away, leaving families behind. And, you know, I write about how we then covered funerals for people yeah. for months and months at a time. And it was this this sucker punch that, that America suffered, New Yorkers in particular. Yeah. And it was this ache that kind of lived on. And, you know, the urge is to move on. Right, because that's part of the coping mechanism of not just journalists but human beings. Yeah, they want to move on. But my fear is that in the moving on process, we forget. And I tell people, never forget isn't just a hashtag that people put on Twitter, mm-hmm. you know, on nine eleven, and then they just move on. You know, um, for me, it's something personal and emotional, and I want to tell people about it because I think it's important. And and teaching here at Kings has, has sort of allowed me to interact with younger people. And I realized last year when I was here, my first year that people just didn't really know much about 9-11. I guess it's it's too early for it to happen in the textbook, so it's not there, but it's also not something that happened 50 years ago. So there was, you know, it's kind of a weird in-between. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like a lot of people are just unaware of, of that day and the meaning of that day. Mm-hmm. I thought something you, you wrote about that was really important for journalists, too, is that we cover these stories and these events, but it wasn't until somebody asked you, how are you doing, that right. you said for the first time ever, yeah. and maybe the only time, right. you actually cried in a newsroom. Right. And I, I couldn't tell this story up until last year without crying. And I feel like the more I tell it, the I've gotten better at that um, because it was something that stayed with me for a long time. Mm-hmm. And, and sort of the back of your head, it's something that, I mean, you can't forget an event like that. And there's people who tell me that who witnessed it on TV and said they can't forget it. So just imagine being there. And people have said to me, oh, you know, you survived 9-11. I say, no, I didn't survive. I'm not a 9-11 survivor. That's that's something that you have to use for people who are first responders, people who rescued other people, people who did acts of heroism. I wasn't a hero. I was just there doing my job. And so I just happened to be there. I could have been somewhere else. Mm-hmm. If I had lived further away from the scene and hadn't gotten there in time, I might have gotten there, you know, five hours after the fact. I mean, that. so I just happened to be in a position where this was happening. And, and like me, there are many, many journalists who survived that day, who lived through that day, who told stories that day. And, you know, that's just sort of something that we do. That's something, that's our job. So mm-hmm. I don't see that as being heroic or brave or, or surviving anything. It's just what we do. Wow. Well, thank you, Clemente, for sharing your story as a journalist, a New Yorker. I think it is so important today of all days to remember not to forget and what that really means. Yeah. So, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thank you.